Good morning. This is kind of part two to a uh, video I did about my evaluation I did on a horse yesterday. Um, this is going to be about leading horses and different theories on leading horses. And then I came up with it this morning because I was thinking about when people lead horses in tack um, in a bridle and how they lead a horse that way and how conflicting the information is if they believe horses should be led behind them. Um, so to, to kind of open that conversation up. So most trainers that I've ever heard say the horse should be led behind you. The horse should follow you. The lead horse leads the way and the horses in the herd follow the horse, the lead horse. I agree with that out in the field. I watch my horses all the time. I see the lead horse pick the path and the other horses single file file, follow the lead horse. Totally agree with that level of respect. However, I don't really see it as respect more than I see it as the lead horse has chosen the path and, and has told the herd that that is the safest path for us to travel. I don't actually see it as respect. Um, so trainers who think that the horse should lead behind you, that's all well and good, I guess, but here's my problem with that. Your horse spooks. You don't have a good relationship with your horse. Your horse thinks of you as something pretty insignificant. If your horse spooks and decides to bolt forward, you, my friend, are going to get run over. There is nothing, if your relationship is not good with your horse, there is nothing that would make your horse think better of stepping on you. Nothing. When your relationship is good, you have a mother-baby relationship with your horse. I always think of a mother and a foal. And a mommy horse would never step on her baby. <clears throat> I've seen plenty of babies run into their mommies, though. Uh, you need to have the horse, at least in your peripheral vision. So I teach all horses to lead where I am just ahead of their front leg. Just ahead. Like, inches ahead. Not, not way ahead. Basically, there's the crease where the neck meets the shoulder. That's where I tell people to be. And that allows the horse's head to be ahead of you. Even if you don't have very good peripheral vision, it allows the horse's head to be, <clears throat> excuse me, to be in front of you enough that you can see their eye, their nostrils, their ears. Those are the indicators that something might be wrong. If you can't see your horse's ears, if you can't see your horse's eyes, you can't see your horse's nostrils, you have no idea what your horse is thinking. You have no idea what your horse is perceiving about his environment. You have no idea how your horse is taking in his experience because you cannot see the feedback from that. If your horse is going to spook, you can see the eye will get starey, the ear will get perked in a direction of whatever is bothering them, or the ears will go out to the sides, or one the head will tip and one ear will go towards, you know, horses use their ears like fingers. It's over there. It's over there. They point at what's bothering them. If they're behind you, you can't see it. Now, if you don't know that something on your right, you and your horse's right, is bothering your horse, and they've given you the sideways ears and tipped their head and pointed at something there, and you walk past that thing and you don't know that that just scared the horse, something that's scary that gets to the horse's tail is going to cause the horse to squirt forward. So if you've just passed something scary and you don't know that your horse just said, that's scaring me, and now you've asked the horse to walk past it and you're you know, in the oblivious, going forward and not realizing that as soon as that gets to your horse's tail, your horse is going to rush forward, you're going to get run over, bumped into. And then you're going to be like, hey, and you're going to think the horse is being disrespectful. And he's not being disrespectful. Something's scaring him and you're in his way. <laughs> uh, if the horse is beside you, you can see all that happen. If the horse is beside you, you can read your horse's environment with him. Um... And then that leads me to wanting to know if, if all horses should be leading behind you, then why is it when the horse is wearing a bridle, we're all taught that we're supposed to grip both reins under the horse's chin so that you have an even feel on the bit and then hold the excess rein with the other hand and we're supposed to walk kind of in an active position. Why is it that we want the horse beside us then? I don't know, food for thought on that, because 
if you think your horse is supposed to lead behind you, and that is how it's supposed to be, then why would we want the horse beside us when they're intact? And how do we explain to the horse there's a difference? Horses don't understand the slang of, well, it means this today, and it means this tomorrow, and it means this whatever. Um, the only thing I have that has many meanings is the wiggle on the rope. The wiggle on the rope is always a downward transition. Canter, trot, trot, walk, walk, ho, ho, back up. It also means pay attention. It also means you've got the wrong answer. It's an interruption of thought. I use it as an interruption of thought. If the horse is not paying attention, I'm going to interrupt their thought on whatever they're thinking about so that they can pay attention to me. If they thought to do something different than what I was actually asking, I interrupt their thought that way. It's also pretty much how it's used as a downward transition too. I interrupt the thought of the canter. I interrupt the, the canter I, to a trot. I interrupt the trot to a walk. I interrupt the walk to a, to a hoe. And I interrupt the just standing there to please back up. I think of a wiggle as probably an interruption. Um, that's the only thing that I do that has multiple meanings. Uh, so I don't understand how we can teach our horses multiple things and expect them to understand. So when a horse wants to walk behind you, when you're leading them with a bridle, or the horse has a hard time understanding they're supposed to catch up to you, when you're leading them with a the bridle, they're not doing anything wrong. They're not doing anything wrong. They're doing exactly what they've been taught. <sighs> Sorry. I, I'm kind of an advocate for teach horses things in black and white. Don't give them gray. When we give them gray, we believe that they're doing things wrong. But truthfully, when we give them gray, we're the ones that are doing something wrong. I always use an example of something that my mother taught me when I was young. Our dogs were not allowed on the couch, but every once in a while I would try to beg my dog to come up on the couch with me and my mother would yell at me and tell me that uh, dogs don't understand sometimes. If she's not allowed on the couch Monday through Thursday, she's not allowed on the couch on Friday either. It is beneficial to the animal to understand the rule in black and white. When you add gray, you add confusion. When you add confusion, you hurt your relationship with the animal because they don't trust your language. They don't trust the clarity of your language. You need your horses to trust the clarity of your language. You need your horses to understand with complete, complete clarity what you want from them. Um, so I guess you could say I'm a little passionate about that. Uh, so that's that. Uh, I'm going to probably think of a couple topics. I have some driving to do later, so there might even be additional podcasts today, but, uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off now and hopefully today's podcast interested you enough to share them and, uh, any podcasts that you've listened to that you'd like to share, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, feel free to like them if you like them so I know what topics people are interested in. And uh, have a great day. Bye.